as we're continuing our study on uh, the life of Joseph and looking at uh, providence as our main subject. We're seeing providence at hand um, in the life of <clears throat> Joseph. And our theme verse for this study is Romans 8 and verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. All things and all events in our life work together for good if we've been called by the gospel and we love God and we express that love by obeying His will. Everything works together together for good. Before we get started in Genesis chapter 41, I'd like to ask Jack if he would uh, direct our minds in a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, it is with humble hearts, knowing that you are a Lord, Master, and our Maker. Lord, we ask that you would, at this time, be with us as we go through this class. We ask that everything that we do will be in accordance with your will. Lord, we ask that you would help us to open our hearts and our minds so that we may better understand your word. Lord, we also ask that you would help us each day to search the scriptures so that we may always be ready to prove the things that we believe. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with the young men and women that are fighting overseas, especially those of the household of faith, we ask that you would grant them that extra measure of protection so that they may return safely to their family and friends. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to help us to stand strong in the faith, to never waver. And Lord, we also pray that when we do fall short, that you would grant us that humble and penitent heart so that we may come to you seeking the forgiveness that we need. Most of all, though, Lord, we are thankful for your son and his sacrifice, your willingness to send him to this earth, to die on Calvary's tree, and his willingness to come so that we might have the opportunity to live with you for eternity. Lord, everything that we ask, we ask through Christ's name. Amen. In chapter 40 of Genesis, where do we find Joseph? He's still imprisoned in chapter 40. He got in prison as a result of what you find in chapter 39. Um, He was accused of what? Accused of raping uh, his master's wife, he was giving. Uh, he was uh, accused of a crime he did not commit. In fact, he, being a godly man, was resisting her advances, and she, as an ungodly woman, said, "I'm going to get back at him. I'm going to accuse him of rape." That's a that's a terrible circumstance, a terrible tragedy, and it resulted with him uh, being in prison. But you see uh, in chapter 40 that the, the Lord was with Joseph even in this situation because in prison he became uh, a leader there and two individuals were brought in who had dreams. Who were they? The baker and the cupbearer to Pharaoh himself. God had given them prophetic dreams concerning their life concerning their destiny, so to speak. And God, through Joseph, interpreted those dreams. And what happened to the baker? He was hung. Birds of the air came and ate his flesh, just like the dream uh, of the birds coming and eating the bread. And what happened to the cupbearer? He was restored. Okay. Okay. So here, here is Joseph in prison for a crime he was accused of that he did not commit. In fact, made every effort to avoid doing anything immoral to Potiphar's wife. 
Now he's in prison, not bitter, not angry, not uh, rejecting God, but still living for God. And still, still doing what's best and having uh, that great work ethic that he had when he was working in Potiphar's house. And so as a result of that, he uh, had the uh, cupbearer's dream interpreted. It came true. He was restored back to Pharaoh. And it says, uh, he says to him, I want you to remember me when you're restored back to Pharaoh because I'm, I'm in here unjustly. I should not be in prison. And look at verse 23 of uh, chapter 40. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So here you have a situation where, um, again, he's doing good, but he's kind of being forgotten. He's being cast aside, so to speak. Um, and that brings us to chapter 41 and verse 1. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. Two full years have passed since this cupbearer has been restored and, and Joseph is still in prison. That God gives a prophecy, a prophetic dream to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a dream. In verse 41, And behold, he stood by the river. Uh, verse 2, Suddenly there came out of the river, this could most likely be referring to the Nile River, seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. So you had seven cows coming out of the river in this dream, and they're, they're healthy, they're fine looking, and they're eating in the meadow. Verse 3, Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, or sickly, some translations say, stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. This was God giving a prophetic dream uh, to Pharaoh for a reason. And he did it for a reason. He could have just said, Pharaoh, there's going to be seven good years and seven bad years. You need to get ready for it. He could have easily just said that to Pharaoh. But God gave him this dream so that he could get Joseph to interpret it so Joseph could be placed in a position of authority to work out God's scheme of things. So he gave this the symbolism. And God, oftentimes, when he would give dreams to people, he would give symbolism. That's what you find in the book of Revelation. Symbolism given, a vision given to, to, to John, and it's in symbolic language. And the problem that people get into is when they try to make literal that which is symbolic. Uh, this is certainly not talking about seven literal cows coming out of a literal river and seven other sickly cows eating up the seven good cows. This is not talking about that literally. It's symb symbolism. It means something. But God did not explain the prophetic dream to Pharaoh because he wanted Joseph to be the one to give the interpretation. Verse 5. He slept and he dreamed a second time. Suddenly, seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. And behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. Verse 7. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now why do you think this happened twice? Emphasis? Yes, emphasis. And also, the same type of dream with different... Uh, imagery it, you know with the first dream Joseph could have just dismissed it now he's having another dream that has the basic same outcome but using different imagery so this second dream is emphasis and, 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 and you know weighing on Pharaoh now what does this mean there's a message trying to uh, be uh, given to me here Verse 8, Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh did what was natural as a pagan individual. He called the magicians. This would be the 
uh, sorcerers, the, the ones who worshipped the, the various deities of Egypt, called them together and said, here's what my dream is, uh, tell me what it means. And they couldn't. You remember with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nebuchadnezzar wanted his magicians and um, sorcerers and such to tell him the dream and the interpretation. And he said, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. And they said, there's no one that can tell you what you dreamed and the interpretation. Here you have Pharaoh giving the dream and saying, you tell me what this means. And uh, they could not do that. And these magicians and such would be yes men to the Pharaoh. They're always going to say something favorably to the Pharaoh. And they're going to say something that would stroke his ego and always say something that's positive um, to Pharaoh. So... Um, they didn't know what the interpretation was. It's not like those who were true prophets of God who would just tell the truth. Even at the risk of their own life, they would tell the truth. The magicians and the uh, pagan people were in the business of pleasing the Pharaoh to save their life. Verse 9, Then the chief butler, or cupbearer, spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with me, his servant, and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream, and one night he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us. Now he's remembering. It's re- he said, there's a young Hebrew man with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us, Each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us. So it happened, he restored me to office, and he hanged him. As he interpreted, it exactly happened, exactly as he told us. I was restored, and the baker was hanged. So, as this information is being dispelled, the the butler or the cupbearer hears that. Again, there's providence. Providence. For the cupbearer to hear that the Pharaoh had a dream, and now he's saying, oh, I remember there was a Hebrew when I was in prison who interpreted our dream, the dream about me being restored. So the hand of providence, again, is there in this situation. Verse 14, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and brought him quickly out of the dungeon, shaved, uh, uh, he shaved, changed his clothes and came to Pharaoh, cleaned him up, got him all cleaned up uh, to present him uh, before Pharaoh. Verse 15, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it is, it is said of you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. Again, think about the situation. There is no way on earth this Hebrew man would have an audience with Pharaoh under normal circumstances. If he, number one, had not been sold into slavery, number two, had not been brought down into Egypt, number three, had not been accused of a crime he hadn't committed, and number four, been put in prison where the cupbearer and the baker were placed. There's no way he would be in this position to stand before Pharaoh without the providential working of God. This is amazing. And notice what he says, verse 16. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. All great prophets of God, men of God in the Old Covenant and in the New, always magnified God. They did not exalt themselves. They said, no, it's God that does this. It's God that does this. And so the, the focus is always on God. They say, it's, it's, it's God who interprets this dream. Verse 17, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river, and suddenly seven cows came up on the river, fine-looking and fat, and they, they fed in the meadow. Verse 19, Then behold, seven other cows came up, After them, poor and very ugly and gaunt or sickly, such ugliness as I have never seen in the land of Egypt. In other words, they were in bad shape, these cows that came out of the river. 
I've never seen it in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and the ugly cows ate up the seven, the fat cows. Verse 21. Now they had eaten them up. No one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. In other words, when they ate the good fat cows, they didn't get any better. They were still in bad shape. Verse 22. I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads uh, came up on one stalk full of, of good, full and good. Verse 23. Then behold, seven grains withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Here's what the dreams are. I have not been able to find anyone to explain this to me. Verse 25. Then Joseph said to, uh, excuse me, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown you what he is about to do. So these are definitely dreams from God. And God is giving a prophecy in symbolic language about what he is going to do in Egypt. Verse 26, the seven good cows are seven years and the seven uh, good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. So they each represent seven years. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 29, indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. There's going to be a seven years of plenty. But, then, but after them, seven years of famine will arise. All the plenty will be forgotten in the land, and the famine will de- deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following it. For it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now think about this. Think about the cycle of things. They didn't have automobiles. They didn't have factories. They didn't have any kind of pollution. But yet you're going to have seven years of plenty and then you're going to have seven years of bad. No man-made effect on the climate. The earth goes through cycles. You know, some of the environmentalists that lived back then, when they saw the drought, they'd say, global warming, global warming. And they'd have to blame the animals, I guess. They were the only ones that would have any effect on the atmosphere because there were no, there were no cars, there were no factories, there were no coal-producing, uh, electric-producing coal plants. The earth goes through cycles. And sometimes we have cycles of warming, and then sometimes we have cycles of cooling. That's just a footnote. But it's just ridiculous how people jump on a certain bandwagon and want to impose upon us uh, certain things. You can't do this, you can't do this because we're causing the earth to heat up. The earth has always gone through cycles of warming, cooling, good times and bad times and will until Christ returns. Look at verse 33. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, verse 34, and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land in the seven plenty years. In other words, you need to get someone in charge of this and during the seven years of plenty, you need to collect one-fifth of the produce So you'll have something during the bad times. Verse 35. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as uh, 
reserved for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. It says, so we're going to have seven good years. During this period of time, we need to get reserves. So the seven bad years come, we will not go hungry. And through God's providence, that will bring Jacob's family down to Egypt. Therefore, they'll be in a position to be saved. See, God is using a pagan nation to preserve his people. Pharaoh doesn't believe in the God of Israel, doesn't believe in the God of the Hebrews, but he's through his providence going to use them and the the food that they collect to preserve his people. God's providence. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Now notice, Joseph didn't seek out this position. Joseph said, you need to find you a guy to be put over this. He didn't say, can I be that guy? He didn't ask. God placed him in that position. You see, humble servants of God don't seek to be in the spotlight. Don't seek to be um, leaders out of their own pride and, and, and uh, self-worth. God places them in positions of leadership. There can be a situation in the Lord's church where a, a man or a group of men want to be elders too bad. They desire it too much. Now, you have to have a desire to be an elder to be qualified to be an elder. But if your desire is impure, if your desire is because you want to run things, if your desire is not what it should be, then that desire is wrong. And so God raises up people in His providence to to be leaders who are humble who aren't seeking to be leaders, but they're, they're placed there through God's providence. And uh, they become uh, leaders because they are qualified through the experiences that they faced. Is that, is that not one reason why that one of the qualifications of the elders is he has to have believing children? That experience that he gets in raising and shepherding his children in the way of the Lord prepares him for taking care of the church of God? And sometimes that takes 18 to 20 years. Sometimes within that time frame. We see here, uh, verse 40, you shall, be over, you shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. you. You're going to be the one in charge. I will only be greater in, than you because I'm on the throne. Verse 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And when he had him ride second chair in his second chariot which he had and they cried out before him bow the knee so he set him over all the land of Egypt now we know that when all this happened initially him going down to Egypt he was 17 years old do you think in his mind at 17 when he was in prison going down to Egypt he said you know I'm going to be second in command to Egypt someday. He had absolutely no clue what God had in store with him. Joseph just had the attitude, whatever situation I find myself in, I'm going to serve God. Whether I'm at Potiphar's house, I'm going to serve God. If I'm accused of a crime I didn't commit and I'm put in prison, okay, I'll serve God there. While I'm there, if I get to do good, I'll help people out. Okay, I'm going to go before the king, I'm going to serve God there. Now I'm second in command. 
and I'm going to serve God here. Verse 44, And Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Verse 45, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zephaneth Paneah, And he gave him a wife, Asneth, the daughter of Potipharia, priest of On. So Joseph went over all the land of Egypt. zephaneth Paneah. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh the king. Now think about this. If he was 17 years old when he was initially sold into Egypt by his brothers and hated him, how long did it take for him to become second ruler of the most powerful empire on the face of the earth? 30. God exalts the humble in due time. And during that 13-year period, God was providentially preparing Joseph for this event right here. And Joseph didn't know. God didn't give him a dream saying, you're going to be second in command someday. He gave him a dream that he didn't even fully understand about the sheaves bowing down, the sheaves of his brothers, and the sun, moon, and the stars bowing down uh, to him. But he didn't fully understand what that dream meant. Now that prophetic dream that he was given at the age of 17 is coming true in the sense of Egypt and later on will be with his family as they come. So he is now given an Egyptian name, Zephaneth Panea. And he is 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Again, paralleling this with the life of Christ. When did Jesus start his earthly ministry? 30. 30. And Joseph, verse 46, went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt, now in the seventh Seven plenty years of the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, laid it up for the food in the cities, and laid up in every city the food of the fields which surround them. Verse 49, Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. So he has an abundance of grain and Archaeologists over there in Egypt have found big cisterns that hold grain. Now, whether they were the actual ones that Joseph was in charge of, that's hard to determine. But they have found huge grain cisterns uh, that belong close to the time period of Joseph in ancient Egypt. So we know this is historically accurate. We're reading actual history here. In verse 50, Joseph, to Joseph were born two sons from the years of famine came out, uh, came whom Asneth, the son of Potiphar, priest of Onan, bore him. Joseph called the name of the first Manasseh. This will be the father of the tribe of Manasseh. And his name means, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. He didn't forget in the sense of he can't remember anymore. He means he forget. This eases the pain. You know, he longed for his, his father's house, his father's family, and being with them. But now, you know, having children, that, that eases the pain, the great joy that children bring to a family. Verse 52, in the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So here is Ephraim, who will be the father of the tribe of Ephraim. Verse 53. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended. Again, the earth goes through cycles. Naturally, it goes through cycles. 
Verse 54. The seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, the famine was in the lands, but was uh, the famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. They had prepared during that seven years of plenty. They had bread stored up so that other people would come to Egypt so that they would be able to get food during this very difficult time. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all of the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. This was seemed to be a global problem. If all the, land, all the face of the earth refers in a literal sense to the whole globe, this is a global cycle. Again, no factories, no cars, no fumes. It's natural. You, the earth goes through cycles. Verse 57, So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. So we see here that peoples from other lands are having to come to Egypt now because of Joseph being there, being in charge and gathering uh, together uh, all of this so they could have bread. Now think about this. What would happen? What would happen to Egypt and many people throughout the other lands if Joseph had never been sold into slavery? They'd have died. We would have very different history. If that terrible thing had not happened to Joseph, one tragedy after another, just bad happenings over and over again, Joseph would not be in the position there to not only be the savior of Egypt in the earthly sense, but the savior of all people in an earthly sense, for all people are having to come to him for food. But it took the bad things to happen for the good to result. Do we not see that in Christ? He was rejected. He was scourged. He was spit upon. He was beaten. He was crucified. Buried. Resurrected. And as a result, anyone who receives Him can become a child of God and enjoy the blessings that God has in store. But see, he had to go through the bad first for the good to result. That's what we see here in Joseph. He had to go through all these bad things to place him strategically in the position to be before Pharaoh. A domino effect, as it were. God's in control of the whole situation. And we'll get a little bit into chapter 42. Time's running out. When Jacob, Jacob excuse me, saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, I indeed have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So here you have Joseph, or excuse me, Jacob and his family, God's people, they are suffering as a result of of the drought. See, when good times happen and blessings happen upon God's people, people benefit. And when hard times come upon the earth, even the people of God suffer as a result. But there you have also Joseph who is in Egypt for their welfare. Now, Jacob doesn't know this. Jacob, what does he think about Joseph? He thinks he's dead. He's convinced in his mind because of the deception of his sons that a wild animal killed him and, and he's gone. And he, so he, Jacob does not know Joseph is in Egypt and, and, and the one responsible for uh, having all of this food available for everyone there in Egypt. He's not, he has no clue that that's the case. All he knows is from word of mouth is that Egypt has food. And if we're going to survive, we need to go, go over there. It's, rather humorous verse 1 why do you look at one another 
Why are you standing around looking at one another? We need to go down to Egypt. So we will live and not die, verse 2. Verse 3, So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's other uh, brother, Benjamin, with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity come and befall upon him. He didn't want something to happen to Benjamin that he thought happened to Joseph. He didn't want him to get hurt. Verse 5, And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the promised land was having hard times. But the hard times they were experiencing was for a greater outcome as well. Think about this. If this had not happened in the land of Canaan, this famine, they would not go down into Egypt. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but I want us to see the big picture. Eventually, Jacob and all of the household of, of Jacob, Israel, are going to relocate down in Egypt. And they're going to be favorable for a while, the Egyptians are to them, until a Pharaoh arises that did not recognize Joseph. And he's going to enslave the nation of Israel because they become so numerous. Then God is going to raise up Moses. Providentially protect him from being killed. Have him be raised in Pharaoh's household. And then God is going to use Moses after some tragedies happen in his life at at an 80-year-old point in his life. When when Moses is 80, he's called to deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And then that is going to cause uh, plagues to come upon uh, the nation of Egypt. God's going to deliver Israel. Israel out of Egyptian bondage, going to split the Red Sea. The army of Egyptians is going to go in after them. Then he's going to bring the Red Sea down upon them and kill them. And guess what? Back in Canaan, they're hearing about this. We know what God did to the Egyptians. And we're scared to death of you. Is that not what Rahab said in Joshua? We heard about what your God did to the Egyptians. The the spies, when they came back, only two gave good reports. Joshua and Caleb. The other ten said, "There's, there's walled, fortified cities over there. There's giants over there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way. We need to go back to Egypt. God said, only Joshua and Caleb are going to go into the land. I'm going to make this group wonder for 40 years in the wilderness, that a new generation will go in because these people have rejected the blessings because of unbelief. This goes into another sermon. We reject and we, we do not have the blessings that we have from God because we don't trust Him. Because we do not put our faith in Him sometimes. That's exactly what happened to Israel. They could have at one, that point gone in and taken the land Joshua and Caleb said they could, but they would not. Again, all that happened for a reason, to bring about the people, to bring about a dynasty, David, and through David's family, the Christ was born. All of this is happening as a scheme of redemption unfolding. But it takes time. Look, there was 13 years between the time Joseph was sold into slavery to the point where he is considered second in command in Egypt. Thirteen years. God's providence is at work. All things work together for good. Now look at verse 6 and we'll end our class. Now Joseph was governor over the land and it was he who sold to all the people of the land And Joseph's brother came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. They didn't know this was their brother. Thirteen years had passed. He looks like an Egyptian now, most likely shaved head, probably wearing the mascara like they did. We have paintings and hieroglyphs that show that they wore the mascara in that culture, the men did. 
He looked very much like an Egyptian. And here they are, according to the prophecy, bowing down before him. This is the providence of God. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue our study. Be reading uh, Genesis chapter 42.